Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you to our webinar on designing universal family care. I'm Bill Arnone. I'm the CEO of the National Academy of Social Insurance. And um, we're going to be uh, talking about a report that the Academy issued on this topic. The report itself is available on our website. And at the end of uh, today's webinar, we'll send you all a link to it uh, directly. I want to acknowledge the work of nearly 30 experts, half of whom are Academy members, who worked diligently on the study panel for over a year. And in particular, our co-chairs, Mark Cohen, whom you'll hear from uh, in a bit, and Heidi Hartman, the study panel's director, Ben Vecti, whom you'll also hear from in a bit, and its lead policy analyst, Alexander Bradley, who will also be joining us on this webinar. Uh, many Academy members uh, served as reviewers of the report itself, and our funding could not, our report could not have been possible without the generous funding of both the Ford Foundation and Care Across Generations. Just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, there's a schedule that you're seeing now. Uh, it'll start with a uh, interview of Ashley Carson Cottingham and Indy Dudagupta. It'll be followed by a presentation of the study panel's findings by Alexandra, Mark, and Ben. And then Cecilia Conrad, our moderator, uh, after she interviews uh, Ashley and Indy, will then rejoin us to do a moderation of our Q&A session. Cecilia leads the MacArthur Fellows Program, the MacArthur Awards for Creative and Effective Institutions, and 100 and Change, the foundation's competition for grants to solve critical problems of our time. Cecilia is also a member of the Academy's Board of Directors. So let me turn it over to Cecilia to get us started. Cecilia? Together, this excellent report. Um, we are going to talk about the report today whose findings explore strategies that states to could pursue to better support families in meeting evolving care needs over the lifetime. The first three sections of the report explore the challenges families face in the realms of early child care and education, paid family and medical leave, and long-term services and support. For each care domain, the panel identified policy options along with the trade-offs associated with specific policy choices. This was done within the context of assuring universal access, affordability, and financial stability through well-defined financing mechanisms. The concluding chapter of the report explored how an integrated approach to care policy might be designed, one offering families a single point of access to these benefits under an umbrella program called Universal Family Care. I am particularly pleased to be part of today's discussion, which will begin with a conversation around where we are, what the status is, what the needs are. And for me, it's a personal issue. 30 some years ago, um, I was a working mom and was very lucky that my 80-year-old mother-in-law was still fit and energetic and could step in to provide childcare. I think as we look at the distribution of when people are having children, that's less and less an option for families. Now, I am engaged in long distance elder care uh, for my mother and I'm an only child, so I'm the only one that can do it. And she's in Texas and I'm in Chicago. So these are issues that near, are near and dear to my heart and I'm really looking forward to talking with Ashley and Indy about this today. We have two speakers to kind of set the stage. Ashley Carson Cottingham is a Deputy Agency Director for the State of Oregon's Office of, Law, of the Long Care, um, the, I'm sorry, Long-Term Care Ombudsperson, um, Ombudsman, which advocates for individuals living in state licensed long-term care facilities, including nursing and assisted living facilities, as well as adult foster homes. Indivar Dutta Gupta is Co-Executive Director of the Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality, where he leads work to develop and advance ideas for reducing poverty and economic inequality in the U.S., with particular attention to gender and racial equity. After I've interviewed Ashley and Indy, we will hear from Alexandra Bradley, who is the lead policy analyst for the Caregiving Study Panel Project, 
Mark Cohen, who is a professor at the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies at UMass Boston, and Ben Vake, who is research director at Caring Across Generations and former vice president for policy at the National Academy of Social Insurance. So first, I would like to turn to Ashley. What are the most pressing issues you're seeing in Oregon related to long-term care? And what are the projections for the future need in Oregon and nationally? Great, thank you so much, Cecilia. And thank you to the National Academy of Social Insurance for the invite to participate today. Um, in Oregon, we're really proud to have been a leader in developing and growing our array of home and community-based long-term services and support. Um, we were actually the first state in the country to develop a waiver for Medicaid long-term care. And then we continue here to pride ourselves in having many options for older adults and people with disabilities. Um, our state's Medicaid program is extremely flexible and we are able to serve over half of those who are eligible for Medicaid long-term services and supports in their own home. So about 52% of those folks who need nursing home level of care are able to stay in their own home. Um, we've seen lots of growth in the numbers of community-based care settings. Um, and we consider community-based care, assisted living, residential care, um, and we've seen growth from the year 2000, we had around 325 facilities of those types, and now we're up to 524 as of 2017. And then we've also seen massive growth in the numbers of memory care endorsed settings. Um, our state had just 62 of these types of facilities in the year 2000, and now we have over 186 memory care communities. I would say the most pressing issues or areas of concern that I have um, are that even with this growth in the capacity to serve older adults and people with disabilities, the growth is often centered in our more populated areas. And so we know that the rural and frontier parts of the state are struggling, and it is oftentimes difficult for Medicaid or private pay consumers to find long-term care placements in that vast part of our state that is rural or frontier. The second biggest issue is that we know that there are many people living with extremely complex long-term care needs and undiagnosed or underdiagnosed dementia and Alzheimer's across the state, and they're generally in non-memory care endorsed settings. So oftentimes long-term care providers are struggling to meet their needs, and this can sometimes lead to neglect or abuse. And the third thing that is pressing here is that there continues to be a workforce shortage due to a fairly tight labor market and turnover can be fairly high for staff in some of the facilities. So these are really hard jobs. They often don't pay high wages and the Medicaid rates um, you know, are struggling to keep pace with the private pay rates. Um, although our Oregon legislature did just make a recent investment in increasing those Medicaid rates. So in the Office of the Long-Term Care Ombudsman, where I am now, um, we see a large number of move-out notices given to residents with complex needs and nowhere else to go. Hmm. Um, we, we really don't see this problem going away anytime soon. The projections for what we're going to need here are I'm, I'm assuming they are they mirror what um, you'll hear Ben and others talk about that that approximately 70% of older adults will need um, three years of long term care in their life. And in Oregon, the information from our Office of Economic Analysis tells us that in 1980, approximately one in 10 Oregonians was over the age 65. And by 2030, there will be one in five Oregonians over the age of 65. So um, if you think through that, in 2030, there will be approximately one million Oregonians over the age of 65 and roughly 700,000 Oregonians that will need some type of long-term services and supports to meet their needs. So in listening to uh, the numbers at the beginning, you talked about the fact that there has been some growth in the availability of facilities, but then also identified the ongoing needs there. What is the average monthly cost 
currently for care in either assisted living in a community or memory care? So we, um, in the state, it, through our Department of Human Services, we partner with Portland State University's Institute on Aging each year, and they do a study of um, long-term care, community-based care settings. And so the most recent information we have from the 2018 report is that for assisted living, um, the average monthly cost is around $3,900 with a low of 2,200 and a high of 8,000 per month. And for memory care indoor settings, we're seeing private pay averages of around 5,600 with a low of 3,500 and a high of um, almost $10,000 a month. The Medicaid rates um, for assisted living range from 1,300 up to slightly over 3,000 per month. And for memory care, the state's Medicaid reimbursement rate is set at $4,200. Um, and then you compare that with what it costs in nursing homes, which we, we really pride ourselves in that we've moved a tremendous number of people out of that institutional nursing home type setting and into the community. But for those who need that support, um, say right away after having an accident or injury, the Medicaid rate is going to be um, around 9,300 in a nursing facility in Oregon. And so understanding that your Medicaid is, is very flexible, there are still people who are paying private rates. Do you think people are aware of how expensive that can be and are they prepared to pay them? Absolutely not. <laughs> I think that um, we hear all the time from people who are shocked when they are in crisis. Um, you know, either they need a placement or they're looking for their loved one. Um, they don't understand in general that your Medicare coverage is not going to pay for long-term services and supports, um, including these, you know, options like in-home supports and services and um, assisted living or memory care. I think there needs to be much greater education around um, the cost and how to better prepare for it. And I'm just so excited about this report. Yeah, and I noted your statistic that 70% of older adult, adults are predicted to need at least three years of this. And, and I'm not sure people have really grappled with how they're going to pay for it. Um, Indy, let me turn to you a little bit. How does the U.S. fall short in meeting caregiving needs across the life cycle? And how can universal family care help? Indy, you may be on mute. Sorry, the short answer is that we fall short in virtually every way you can imagine. Uh, Ashley touched on some of it, but I'll add a little bit more to thinking uh, throughout the life cycle. Um, you know, the, the in general, the high quality of caregiving affects really everyone uh, at all ages. Uh, earlier in life, um, parents are paying nearly $10,000 a year on average. It's obviously substantial variations by region for daycare um, or child care. Uh, Head Start serves only about 31% of eligible children. Early Head Start reaches even a smaller fraction, just 7%. And only eight states and the District of Columbia have passed paid family and medical leave laws, leaving most workers with really no option, Cecilia, for taking time off for pregnancy, bonding with a child, or caring for an aging parent while still getting paid. Uh, you have to remember uh, about 40 plus percent of households in America, according to Federal Reserve research, uh, really would struggle and be overwhelmed by a $400 emergency. Um, uh, and as Ashley mentioned, uh, you know, majority of people um, who are say, turning 65 or so today will at some point need long-term supports and services, which could cost you know, $50,000 or more a year in many instances if you sort of add up those monthly um, those monthly rates. And uh, you know, I'll just add that um, for some parents, in particular, confronting the challenge of finding affordable quality care, especially, uh, frankly, for mothers. Um, it's so hard that uh, the answer is to limit or give up work entirely. Um, uh, almost four in 10 women state that they've had to take a significant amount of time off from work to care for a child or family member. And more than one in uh, four have, or 27% have described quitting their job for this reason. We have some estimates suggesting that 
the aggregate value of wages that just parents forego to care for their young children is almost a hundred billion dollars annually. And in particular, women get hit real hard, as you know, Cecilia, where um, especially older women um, leave the labor force and look for an aged loved one. Um, they lose not only uh, an estimated two hundred seventy-four thousand dollars in lifetime wages, but also in social security benefits. So, sort of getting hit twice in some ways. And uh, what I'm excited about here, of course, is that universal family care could certainly help increase labor force participation, wages and income, particularly for women, by allowing people to keep their jobs and their hours, even if their loved ones have caregiving needs that are just part of life, um, while creating new caregiving jobs that are going to be really hard to outsource, uh, sorry, offshore and automate. Um, so uh, I think this uh, report and uh, the broad frame of universal family care is really helping us think hard in many ways about structuring families and the economy going forward. So let's turn to that workforce for a moment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was lucky enough to have my mother-in-law. And as you noted, some people are managing this by uh, the elder care by retiring early, which has its consequences. Uh, but there is the flip side of the high cost, and that is that there is a need for a workforce who needs to get decent wages, correct? How can universal family care help address their needs? That's a great question, Cecilia. I mean, we have these big conversations among policy makers and others about sort of the future of work and workers. And to me, care caregiving is absolutely central to it. Um, the responsibilities of caregiving, caregiving simply can and do hold people back from other work and then caregiving itself is work and we just don't value that enough, partly in part because who has been doing the caregiving and I mean in many cases um, black and brown women and immigrant women. Um, so I think there's a big shift that we need to go through as a society here. Um, and keep in mind, despite the high cost of this care, again, uh, similarly to the LTSS side, for early care and education, these occupations are among the lowest paid in the country. Um, makes it very difficult to recruit and retain staff. The median hourly wage in 2015 uh, for women child care workers was less than $10 an hour. Um, compare that to uh, pre-K and kindergarten teachers, which was $11.54 an hour, still low. Um, and the poverty rate for women child care workers is twice the poverty rate for women workers overall. Uh, so the investments in workforce that's sort of part of the UFC framework, I think, are essential to thinking differently about ca caregiving. and. We wrote a report in 2017 called Building the Caring Economy, where we really highlighted a variety of measures that states can even take to ensure that caregiving jobs are good jobs that are attractive to workers, including some of the obvious steps of improving wages and benefits and investing in training and workforce development to promote recruitment, retention, and economic mobility of the caregiving workforce, but also uh, new and additional strategies. Um, and uh, I hinted at this earlier, but I'll just close in response to this question by emphasizing how important UFC can be to advancing racial equity. Um, you know, there's a lot of things we need to do, obviously, to advance racial equity in this country, but addressing caregiving needs, especially when we also focus on the workforce, should be up there on that list. Um, early childhood care and education workers, for example, are mostly women. Nearly half are women of color. At least 20% are immigrants. Um, and I think advancing gender and racial equity in the U.S. requires improving these jobs and protecting the rights of immigrant workers as well to ensure that we have a sufficient and well-trained uh, caregiving workforce. And, and so you've highlighted there some potential benefits of it. We know that there's going to be a cost of implementing uh, universal family care. How do those costs compare to the expected gains that the economy and society might realize? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and and I think we have some enough research to have some strong indications here of uh, the direction, to some extent the magnitude, but um, we'd certainly love more. But um, with a major investment along the lines of what's envisioned in this report um, from the National Academy of Social Insurance, you can imagine some substantial gains in a variety of areas. Um, labor force participation and long-term earnings are likely to increase, particularly for women, and uh, but also through the creation of new, higher-quality caregiving jobs. 
Long-term childhood development outcomes, uh, cognitive, linguistic, social, emotional, and motor are likely to improve whenever we've invested in improving the quality of caregiving jobs. And frankly, in many cases, just low wage, low paid jobs, period, we see serious improvements in the quality of the service provided. Um, so when you think about the most important sort of input um, into caregiving, it's the workers. Uh, so I would expect meaningful, measurable, sizable improvements in the outcomes of the people being cared for, um, including potential for improvements in infant mortality and children's physical health and nutrition. So, um, you know, in general, I think the health outcomes, both physical and mental of caregivers and those they provide care to and their family members are likely to improve. Thank you, Ashley and Indy. And let me remind everyone that there is an opportunity to submit questions uh, through the Q&A, both to Ashley and Indy, and then uh, for our next panelist, and we'll go back to those at the end of the webinar. So let me uh, turn now to Alexandra, Mark, and Ben, uh, who are going to talk about the report's findings. And Alexandra, I believe you are leading off. Thank you so much, um, and it is a pleasure to be here to talk about this. Um, I'm here to start with early child care and education. So, Indy spoke really beautifully to some of the points that we have here, but why is early child care and education um, a part of this conversation, especially in regards to social insurance, where, you know, early child care and education hasn't been um, a focus of social insurance in the past? Um, and I would argue that, sorry, the, uh, there we go. Um, so we are talking about um, honestly preparing for the success and the development of our future workers, our future caregivers, and the broader community. Um, and so childcare and education is not just kind of a niche issue, um, and we haven't held it on par with traditional K through 12 education, which we provide an investment in um, as a society. Um, but early childcare and education has really been left out of that conversation, and a lot of the workers have been held as different, um, have been held to different standards, different rates of pay, um, of value, um, and a, an investment on a public scale in early childcare and education um, would kind of bring the you know zero to five um, education on par with our K through 12 system, which we have all agreed as a society is something valuable. Um, and we also uh, owe an obligation to this in a way because the existing patchwork of federal and state early child care and education programs um, is really hard for families to navigate and it also is really hard for the state to navigate. So nobody really wins from the system that we have right now. Only very low income families are eligible for most of the benefits that we have available right now. Um, and the applications, the eligibility requirements are really complicated, really confusing, and require a lot of monitoring by the states. Um, so it really creates a system where nobody wins um, and we don't have a unified force uh, to address the issue. Um, so when I look at some of the um, rationales behind um, the current system, sorry, this uh, slides are moving slowly. Um, come now, move forward for me. Um, so we, we looked at a bunch of different issues. So some of the things that we want to talk about are, um, as Indy mentioned, the uh, uh, the workforce is deeply discriminatory right now. We have a very um, low paid and um, undervalued workforce um, and paying caregivers for zero to five um, would benefit not only the workforce, but also the children. Um, this is a time of rapid um, development, a time of um, pre, pre kind of pre setting the stage for educational achievement in the long term, but also social achievement, professional achievement, um, and just life achievement in general. Um, and then finally, we're improving equity and access to care. So if we have a robust system that is actually funded kind of universally by states and by um, society as a whole, we're kind of investing in a more equitable distribution in zero to five, just like we've invested in a more equitable distribution of K-12 education. Um, so we look at fewer regional, hopefully fewer regional um, disparities in access, um, decreases in uh, lack of access to cultural competence or diversity, um, and perhaps even addressing things like non-standard hours where a lot of workers are um, 
unfortunately like unable to access the current system of early child care and education because the hours or the um, times that are available to them are so limited that it juts up against their work hours. Um, so we came up with three policies that were options for the early child care and education space um, when we were looking at the report. Um, the first of these was a universal comprehensive program so that um, all kinds, all care would be provided for by the program um, and that would be very much on par with the K-12 education system. Um, all children would be eligible and it's ex essentially an expansion of the existing public education system. This would be a high upfront public investment but it would be also very much akin to investments that we have made in the past. So I wanna just uh, reiterate that even though it looks like a high ticket item, it also is something that we have agreed is a worthwhile high ticket item in the past. Um, and so we, we are looking at treating that early childhood and education as the same as a K through 12. Um, the second option was an employment-based contributory program. So in this model, um, only working parents um, and only the children of working parents would be eligible for benefits. Um, so coverage would not be universal um, and expanding coverage to folks who don't have consistently working parents would require additional provisions and other laws in place. Um, and determining eligibility for such a system could be administratively challenging. And finally, the last option would still be a universal option, much like the comprehensive program, um, but would be a subsidy program. So all children would be eligible, but the full cost of their care would not be taken care of, um, or may or may not be. Um, so in some cases, families may receive enough of a subsidy to fill in the gaps, and in some cases they may not, depending on how generous the state decided to be. Um, the question is also whether or not that amount is sufficient for different families. So it may be sufficient to cover the gap for a higher middle class family, but not for a lower income family that doesn't qualify for the current benefits packages in existence. Um, but this program does provide greater flexibility for states, also greater flexibility for families, and may be an option that allows states to kind of tiptoe into uh, a universal program while still staying comfortable with what um, is available to them. Um, all right, and then, uh, sorry, these slides are not there. Um, and then some of the trade-offs are that any program that is universal um, is better positioned to improve equity in child development because you're affecting all children in the same way. So you're not saying some families are getting in, some families are not. All children are being equitably brought into this program. Programs that are employment-based and focus on labor force participation, while they can be attractive to some states, they will leave many children out and may actually require a more intensive um, administrative program from the state that will cost more money because you kind of have to constantly monitor who's in and who's out of the system. Um, all programs will need to include space for private child care providers. Um, we can't imagine a system where we would ramp up from zero to 100 of public education existing in a quick span of time. So a lot of these programs will require some collaboration with private child care providers to make sure that they can provide um, gap, fill in gaps in the um, care provision between public and nothing, which we have right now in a lot of cases. Um, and just to reiterate, if the benefit amounts are insufficient, especially in a subsidy or voucher program to make a meaningful difference for families, inequality may actually increase because higher earners are gonna get what they need to fill in the gaps, but lower earning families are not gonna be able to still pay for the cost of care. Um, so I'm gonna switch over to paid family and medical leave. Um, as folks know, we do have a very like vast landscape of existing state programs. Um, five states do have a, ooh, um, five states do currently have a program for uh, paid medical leave, um, and four states have a program for paid family leave that was tacked onto their temporary disability program. Um, and then we have four other states, um, the District of Columbia, um, Connecticut, Oregon, Massachusetts, oh sorry, five, and Washington, um, who are implementing new PFML programs. Um, and so some of the things that we want to consider when we're looking at state decision points for a paid family medical leave program is the structural design. Um, so how is the program designed and who's responsible for managing it? Um, the financing, so who pays for that program and how are revenues collected? That might be um, a payroll tax on employers, on employees. Each state has made different choices in that regard. Um, qualifying events, so is this just for parents? Um, is this for family caregiving? Is this for medical leave? Um, eligibility requirements such as work history, and then who can you take time off to provide care for? 
um, who is an eligible family member under the system. Um, so we have three policy options that we brought up in the, pro, in the report. Um, contributory social insurance is the most common version. It's very much akin to Social Security or other social insurance programs that we're very familiar with. It simplifies administration. It makes one blanket program for the whole state such that everybody's in one pool. Um, it spreads the risk very broadly and it reduces the risk for discrimination because employers are not involved in any way, shape, or form. It is a state program that, pays, that people pay into, receive benefits out of. Um, some states, especially New York, um, have chosen a hybrid social insurance program such that there are private options, but they're regulated. Um, some of the other states have opt-out options for like certain employers to cover their employees um, on their own. Um, this does introduce a high level of administrative complexity over an exclusive state fund. It does give employers a little bit more choice, but it requires a heavy amount of regulation. So we wanna just consider the trade-off there. It doesn't, I know it sometimes sounds like it might be an easier option because you're giving um, employers the option to opt out, um, but actually you're at, gonna have to add a whole nother layer of regulation on top of the existing layer. Um, and as I mentioned, you have a bunch of different funding sources. Most of the ones that exist right now are some combination of shared between employer, employee, or in some cases, one or the other. But you do have those private market coverage options as well as some other backstops that you can add to cover things like administrative costs, such as general revenues or earmark taxes. And that's it for me. As we turn to Mark, let me just remind you that you can put questions in the Q&A at any time. Uh, we will get to all of them uh, at the end of the panel. Mark? Thank you so much. Um, I'm trying to start the, uh, uh, there we go. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and thanks very much to the National um, Association of Social Insurance, National Academy of Social Insurance. Um, one of the high-level questions is why, why start with the social insurance approach when we're talking about uh, long-term services and supports? And frankly, long-term services and supports is perfect. It's, it's the perfect liability. It's perfectly suited uh, to risk pooling through insurance. You have highly variable costs that are faced by people. They're typically very difficult to predict, and they're potentially catastrophic. Now, under the current system, those with high, uh, high incomes can pay for LTSS out of their savings or with private insurance benefits. But those in the broad middle class either forgo paid care, uh, which leads uh, to a great deal of, of uh, family support and frankly burden on family members, or they can pay for care out of limited income and savings until they deplete their assets and qualify for Medicaid. And this occurs because for many middle-class individuals, private long-term care insurance options are out of their financial reach, yet they don't immediately qualify for Medicaid when they have an LTSS need. And even those who do qualify for Medicaid, whether low or middle-income people, must contribute most of their income towards service costs, and they may be forced to have to rely on nursing homes because they cannot access sufficient home and community-based services in order uh, to remain in their own home. Now, a social insurance approach to this risk could go far in efficiently and affordably addressing coverage gaps. Uh, for a number of reasons, social insurance contributions tend to be somewhat more affordable than private insurance premiums. First, you tend to pool risk across the entire workforce, Contributions are generally paid for much longer than premiums are paid to an insurance company. There are typically lower administrative costs um, compared to private insurance. And there's no need for underwriting uh, with its associated expenses to assess and filter out high-risk applicants since coverage is typically universal and applied to large risk-diverse populations like the entire uh, workforce. Now, when thinking about uh, some of the critical issues in designing a program, uh, the first one, of course, is eligible populations. Who is eligible to participate in the program? For example, whether or not uh, to include those who are currently disabled and under 65, as opposed to just those over age 65, would have a major impact on program costs, the feasibility and the suitability of specific program designs, and options for how a program might be financed. 
So the decision also has important implications for the level of public support for a program. So this is one issue that a state would, would need to take into consideration. A second is generational transition issues. The program could cover only those who start paying in right now and only some years from now after they have vested in the program, that, that is paid in long enough to earn benefit eligibility, or potentially set aside different funding sources to pay for those people who have needs that are more current. There's also the timing and duration of coverage. And if you look across states today, you'll note on the first dollar coverage, front end coverage, Washington state is the first state to have implemented a social insurance approach. And they've adopted front end coverage, which means that benefits uh, begin to be paid as soon as someone becomes disabled or after a brief uh, waiting period, but they last for a limited amount of time, let's say maybe a year's worth of benefits or two. Others have talked about back end catastrophic coverage where benefits begin only after someone has been disabled for an extended period, um, let's say two to three years, and then the public program acts as a backstop. And then finally, there are comprehensive program options where once somebody comes, becomes disabled, they receive a certain, and by disabled, what I'm talking about is having functional or cognitive limitations necessitating the need for human assistance uh, to continue living independently. And here, benefits in a comprehensive coverage option would be paid during the entire period of need. In terms of benefit eligibility criteria, the key questions really are when does an individual become uh, qualified for benefits? At what level of functional impairment does someone have to be? In terms of the level of the benefit of payment, how high is the daily or weekly amount of money that would be paid out in benefits? Should it be pegged to service costs in a home care setting, for example? Should it cover room and board in a nursing home? And then finally, what form of benefit? You could imagine uh, giving cash, a pure cash benefit to maximize flexibility for the individual or service reimbursement. When, when somebody incurs expenses, the benefit will be paid. And there are various trade-offs that we point out in the report related to these different design choices. Frankly, there's a, a continuum uh, of approaches. In this next slide, um, I would like to make, uh, make two points. And um, see if it's, there we go. Um, first, uh, this, it, it's important to note when you look at this slide, this is the projected duration of need among seniors um, who become functionally or cognitively impaired. It's important to note that a little more than half of those turning 65 will at some point in their lifetime require significant amounts of LTSS. Uh, and the other half of seniors would receive no benefits from any type of program since they won't have any need. Second, as you can see, a front-end program that provides coverage for the first two years would cover the entire, duration, the entire duration of care for about half of seniors who will need care for less than two years. For the other 49%, it would cover the first two years, after which they would be on their own. Now, in terms of um, some of the key issues related to financing, there are a number of um, considerations. Um, Uh, I'm trying to move the slide for, there we go. Okay, thank you. So what is the source that would make sense for a state? Recognizing that there are trade-offs associated with various financing options. So on the left hand here, you can see um, a variety of different options that a state uh, could take into account um, to key off of its, its financing. It could be existing federal social insurance programs, state social insurance programs, or actually new financing programs. And on the right side of this screen are the criteria that the working group came up with for making judgments about the efficacy or desirability of particular financing sources. We felt that these were really the key evaluative yardsticks to help policymakers to decide what makes most, uh, most sense for them. 
Another uh, important issue, which is shown on this next slide, is that states are going to have to um, take into account or make decisions about the integration of the program with other payers and benefits. And these are issues that can be really complicated. And they generally fall into three categories. First, there's coordination of benefits with other, uh, with other payers. By law, for example, Medicaid is the, is the payer of last resort for its beneficiaries. So Medicaid would be the secondary payer for any new LTSS services that would be covered by a new program. And regarding private long-term care insurance policies, they too include a coordination of benefits provision designed to prevent duplication of coverage and overpayment. And then there are a host of federal Medicaid funding issues. I mean, one of the things you wanna make sure is that a new program should be structured so that the state will not lose federal Medicaid matching dollars. Um, in, in one approach, the new program could be designed to cover LTSS services or programs not or not fully covered by the state's Medicaid program. Alternatively, states could seek a federal waiver, allowing the new program to operate as the secondary payer to Medicaid. You can think of other waivers to retain projected federal matching dollars. It's a really important issue that states will have to, have to grapple with. And finally, given the growth in managed um, LTSS services in the states, um, states implementing a new social insurance program should consider how the benefit would be integrated into their existing delivery systems as a way to both hold down costs and improve care and quality of life of state residents. So in this last slide that is up right now, Ultimately, if a state implements a new program, the success of that program should be measured against the objectives for which it is established. And the working group put forward some of the high level criteria that a state might wanna to use to assess program effectiveness, including the following. Does the program actually improve access to LPSS? To what extent does the additional money brought into the system by the new program allow the purchase of additional services? Does it improve key outcomes for people with disabilities? Does it reduce family out-of-pocket spending? To what extent does the program relieve financial burdens on families? Does it increase, for example, or reduce, I should say, budgetary pressure on Medicaid itself? Does it, is it financially sustainable? Can it be paid for over the long term in a stable uh, manner? And perhaps most, or one of the most important factors is, is this program structured in a manner that will garner broad public support, not just at the time that it's implemented, but also over time, and how long is that support likely to persist? So uh, with that, I will turn this over to Ben, and I'd be happy with others to entertain questions uh, shortly. Ben? All right, thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you, everyone. So, universal family care would be uh, sort of the, the culmination of these three subsidiary programs that we've talked about thus far. It would be a new social insurance program to which everyone would contribute while they are working and from which everyone would benefit. And it would combine um, access to early child care and education, paid family and medical leave, and long-term services and supports. So it would provide access to all three of these programs we've been discussing uh, in, an, in one integrated um, user interface. The study panel found that a strong case could be made for an integrated universal approach to these programs through social insurance. And there are four reasons why. First of all, we all juggle work and care. Long um, gone are the days when only low-income families struggle to balance work and caregiving responsibilities. 
Second, social insurance provides a more efficient way to pay for care. Families would pay a little bit from each paycheck rather than paying, uh, rather than having the uh, considerable costs of care hit them at a moment of crisis. For example, when someone needs to uh, go into a nursing home or needs a home health aid, needs to have their bathroom renovated to make it accessible for them. If that happens to my mom, for example, then I'm faced at once of having to reduce my work hours to help take care of her, while at the same time as our family has the expense of hiring uh, a home health aid or renovating her bathroom. So all those expense, expenses would hit us at once. Through social insurance, rather than paying those all at once, we would pay a little bit uh, over the life uh, course uh, so that uh, those expenses are, are funded in a more efficient way. Third, uh, a universal uh, uh, social insurance approach to these care challenges is more family friendly because rather than have a family not only have to deal with the emotional uh, challenges and caregiving challenges that care episodes uh, bring us, um, uh, rather than have to deal not only with that, but also with the financial challenges, uh, a program like Universal Family Care could ease the financial burden and let families focus on being with their loved ones. And finally, an integrated approach uh, through Universal Family Care could provide a one-stop shop for families rather than having, them having to deal with multiple separate sets of bureaucratic hurdles in discrete programs. So we've talked about policy throughout this webinar thus far. Let's change gears now and go from the macro perspective to the micro perspective. Uh, let's, let me give you a taste of what a one-stop shop, uh, one shop could look like from a family's perspective. Um, apologize, these slides uh, jump forward um, quickly. Um, so we worked, uh, Caring Across Generations worked with uh, a firm in Silicon Valley named IDEO to help flesh out what the user experience could look like for universal family care. We interviewed dozens of sandwich generation caregivers to find out what their care needs are and how public policy could be designed in a way that would be useful to them. One of those sandwich care generation caregivers was Leah, who uh, is pictured in the previous slide if it, if it returns to us. Um, there she is with her family. Um, Leah works full-time as a marketing manager. She's the 30-year-old pregnant mother of a two-year-old son and part-time caregiver for her 78-year-old father who has serious health issues. This is a real family that we interviewed. She worries the care for her dad has taken her away from her son. Imagine if her dad had a fall and his situation deteriorated again to the point that he needed a home health care aid. How might Leah, who is balancing work and care, access a universal family care program? So to, to think through what that could look like from a family's perspective, we developed a web app with IDEO to help us think through how a family-centered, streamlined process of claiming childcare paid leave and long-term care benefits would look like. So as Leah begins to explore her options for how she can get care for her father, uh, Universal Family Care would offer her an integrated approach to care supports grounded in her specific family care situation. First, it would ask her what she needs and then it would suggest a personalized set of supports uh, which she might be eligible for. So in other words, instead of her going to apply for long-term care benefits in one program, say Medicaid, Medicaid LTSS, and then applying for child care benefits for her child, and then applying for paid leave on her own, she would have one program to turn to. So we designed a web app to see how we could design that in a streamlined way. Here's the welcome screen that Leah would encounter when she goes to a web app which she could access through her phone. This could also be, doesn't have to be digital, it could also be going to a universal family care program office, but the app makes it very tangible what an integrated approach could look like. Instead of applying for one program, like a child, the program would ask her, uh, would ask her what her family care needs are and who she's applying for benefits for. So family care needs are interrelated. So Leah could be looking for care sports for herself, for her own paid family leave, for example, to care for her child or her father, or she could be looking for child care benefits, or she could be looking for um, uh, a home care aid for her father. In this case, it is for her father, so she clicks on a family member. The app would ask her which family member, and she would click on her my parent. Leah would then be asked um, uh, to fill in some information about that person, their name, 
um, what care supports needs uh, her father has, uh, what other kinds of programs he might be eligible for, so benefits could be coordinated. And then over the course of Leah's lifetime, there will be multiple moments like this when she might need universal family care. In each of these moments, UFC could offer Leah guidance, resources, and relief to help her meet her caregiving responsibilities. Let's fast forward in time to uh, look at a, a point in time when Leah is looking at care that's available to three of her family members, her son, Joshua, her, her father, Harold, and uh, her mom. Here in, in an integrated program like Universal Family Care, uh, one family member, family caregiver, could see, could access benefits to, for multiple family members, for multiple types of benefits, and could see, could keep a, a clear overview of how she interacts with the program, what benefits she's eligible for, uh, in a very efficient, streamlined way. There are four pillars to, to the universal family care concept. One is that work is the foundation. This is a social insurance program. So everyone who is working would contribute while they're working and the program would enable people to work. It would be flexible and portable. So it would cover people across jobs, including 1099 income, just as social security does, for example. It would be a single access point for a variety of support needs. And it would invest also in the care workforce, uh, making sure that there are job quality standards for care workers addressing the issues that Indy and Alexander talked about before. One lever for that, for example, would be um, having uh, state job quality standards uh, in order for care providers to be reimbursable through the program. The study panel outlined two broad structural approaches uh, that could be that a state or the federal government could take if they were going to pursue universal family care. One would be a contributory social insurance approach this is a classic social insurance approach. Think Social Security or Medicare, where it's self-funded through payroll taxes. An earned benefit does not cover those outside of the paid labor force. A more comprehensive approach would incorporate additional revenue from other revenue sources, uh, but would provide comprehensive uh, population coverage at a higher program cost. And within each of these approaches, states could either adopt a core approach with modest benefits, or it could they could adopt an expanded approach with benefits uh, that are more adequate to uh, supporting families and their care caregiving needs. Every state considering uh, adopting universal family care would need to decide how comprehensive its coverage would be and how adequate its benefits with corresponding trade-offs and program cost. And states would make these decisions based on their own unique sets of constraints, preferences, et cetera. We did preliminary modeling with the Actuarial Research Corporation to see, get a, a ballpark estimate for what this would cost. We are going to do additional, more detailed microsimulation modeling this winter, uh, but the preliminary modeling uh, yielded the, the table that you see before you, which suggests that for a middle of the road package that had comprehensive uh, universal uh, childcare, uh, affordable childcare, uh, the standard paid family medical leave coverage provided by the Family Act proposal and front end uh, long term services and supports coverage, uh, which would be the coverage for the first year or two of need. That a program like that, if you use the Medicare Part A payroll tax as your tax basis, would cost about 1.55% of payroll or a percent of earnings on earnings up to 200,000 for an individual or 250,000 for a household with an additional tax of 0.66% on income above those thresholds. So that just gives you a ballpark sense of, of what uh, a universal family care package could cost. And we'll do more detailed modeling again this winter. Uh, in terms of the financial uh, integration of a universal family care program, you could either have one care insurance fund, uh, or you could have uh, two funds, for example, to, to give to do justice to the fact that LTSS financial management typically takes place over a 75 year horizon that might need its own fund, whereas child care and paid family leave uh, benefits are typically uh, uh, budgeted over a one to two year time horizon. So perhaps you would end up with two separate uh, funds. Key takeaways on the, the, uh, uh, the, the case for universal family care 
uh, approach is that busy family caregivers need a streamlined system of supports to manage their care needs. Uh, the status quo is probably the most costly option in terms of the impact on, on caregivers' labor market participation, earnings, savings, and overall well being. Um, and having a one stop shop that addresses all these needs in an integrated way could be more efficient uh, than the status quo where families are on their own, um, or if you were to create parallel programs, an integrated approach could be more efficient. Plausible benefits to society uh, include uh, for families making affordable childcare on LTSS supports widely available, uh, empowering families to make their own decisions about how to balance work and family care. Um, for workers, it could reduce lost wages and the need to potentially leave the workforce to care for a loved one. Uh, for care recipients, it could make early care and education available to all children, giving all children uh, a decent start in life. And in the long-term care space, it could increase self-direction, uh, empowering people with disabilities to determine how and by whom their care needs are met. Uh, for the care workforce, uh, investing in the care infrastructure through a program like this could improve the quality of care jobs, uh, these jobs that can't be outsourced, as Indy mentioned. And for states, it has the potential to uh, bring in new revenue to fund a social insurance program in these areas, which would reduce pressure on state Medicaid programs to provide to meet the growing long-term care needs of their populations in the coming decades. And with that, um, I will give the floor to back to Bill and Cecilia to move to Q&A. Yes, thank you. We have a first question. Uh, what are the, which I think is originally addressed to Alexandria, but I'm gonna open up to the panel after she opens. What are the policies for other OECD countries regarding early childhood care and education. So I'm gonna pose that first, and then I also wanna take my own privilege to say, and for the long-term care, the other sorts of elder care issues we've talked about. So Alexandra, I'll start with you. Yeah, um, so I will, I will speak only to early childcare and education here, but um, it's, um, so the United States is kind of relatively far behind other OECD nations. Um, I would say it does vary by age. So we do see that kind of um, re rewind where like you start at five, at four, you have higher rates of coverage than for younger children. So um, about 90% of four-year-olds are covered in two-thirds of the OECD nations, um, and almost two-thirds of children are covered in those in that same number uh, at three. Um, so you're looking at pretty high rates of coverage for pre-K. Um, those numbers drop off a lot more when you're looking at infants or um, younger children. Um, and comparatively, in the United States, you're looking at uh, around a third of four-year-olds are covered across the country. That number very, varies highly by state. Um, so some states you're looking at 80-90% coverage, some states you're looking at almost nothing. Um, I'm thinking about like DC, Oklahoma, some states that have really worked really hard to get coverage for four-year-olds um, and do have universal four-year-old programs are looking at 80-90% of coverage. But then you're seeing some states where there's virtually no public investment in pre-K. Um, so the United States is kind of quite far behind the OECD, but they are very much also focusing on those older ages of pre-K three and four. Um, the data on the younger children is a lot more varied um, and maybe a lot closer to what we're seeing in the United States. Uh, did anyone want to add to that, Indy? Uh, for that answer, um, and thanks for the question. I would say that in general, there are a pretty wide range of ways that other wealthy countries uh, try to address the childcare needs of families. But uh, the common sort of thread is that uh, there's very sizable public investments and um, typically much higher rates of participation in the preschool years in particular. Um, there are some countries like Canada, which also has a somewhat federal system like we do and uh, costs very dramatically, uh, famously in Quebec, it's particularly affordable, a fraction of the cost of, um, of uh, neighboring provinces, uh, in some cases because of sizable public investments. Um, and uh, I would say that some uh, the countries typically um, have some uh, hybrid public-private sort of models, which is sort of uh, similar to much of what's 
happening and been proposed in the U.S. Um, uh, but some t some countries also similarly like the U.S. Head Start uh, an early Head Start system. Um, well, they might run the child care through um, sort of uh, community-based organizations or essentially entirely funding it um, publicly. Um, so there's a lot more detail certainly to be learned, uh, but I think the key takeaways from looking at other sort of wealthy countries on the child care front is that um, there's really no way to solve this the problems that we face here without sizable public investments and that um, to some extent, uh, even though it's a sort of totally different topic, but somewhat similar to healthcare, that there's more than one way to skin the cat. Definitely, I, and yeah, I completely agree. And and I and I think it goes back to the point that we were making earlier that that, that public education on a K two K through twelve level is publicly an investment in the United States and in other countries. And this is just kind of bringing um, pre K and early education on par with that. And does anyone have any information on elder care or long-term care and how that's handled? This is Mark. Ben, um, I'm Mark yeah. um, this, this is Mark and, and Ben, of course, can, uh, can add in. Um, there are many OECD countries that do indeed have um, LTSS financing. Typically, they tend to be mixed systems where there's a, a limited public benefit um, and it's often supplemented um, by private uh, private insurance. So you've got um, in, in France, in Germany, uh, Japan, uh, England and the U.S. I think stand out um, in terms of their the, the fact that most of their system, most of our system is, is means tested rather than uh, socially insured. Add to that. Ben, were you adding something? Can you hear me? Hello? I can't, go ahead, go ahead. Can you hear me now, yes. So, yes, yeah, so uh, as Mark was saying, uh, England and the US are, are laggards uh, behind our peer nations in, term, in that we have res what are called residual programs that, that are only designed to uh, provide supports for low income households in the long-term services support space. Most of our peer nations over the last 10 or 15 years, and some of them even far fewer, far, far earlier, um, have had um, invested in, in universal long-term care. Scandinavia has developed that since the post-war, post-World War II period. It gradually developed it since then. Um, Holland created a system in the six, 1960s, Germany in the 1990s, and since then, uh, Taiwan, uh, Japan, um, uh, France has a system as well. Most of the, I would say majority of those programs are social insurance programs. Uh, and then they have something like our Medicaid program as a backstop to help uh, if, if, if the social insurance benefit isn't generous enough to cover all the costs, then the social, then the social assistance program in the, in the respective country will kick in to help meet the remainder of the need. Uh, but, uh, you know, all these countries have dealt with the same demographic challenges in the recent decades and are, are realizing that the prime age uh, uh, care, family caregivers who would otherwise be forced to leave the workforce to provide that care directly because of a lack of professional care supports, um, that, that, that having those people uh, leave the workforce is extremely detrimental to their societies in terms of GDP growth, but also to those individual households in terms of their economic security. And so they've made corresponding efforts to uh, to uh, provide a, you know a more efficient societal approach to to uh, ensuring against those risks rather than leaving households to fend for them on their own. Thanks, and and I want to pose one more question, Ben. I was struck by your use case um, example is is really helpful. And I would turn back to uh, the story I told at the beginning about having a mother-in-law who took care of my son. And there are people out there who would like to have a family member engage in either in the child care or the elder care. Does universal family care offer them anything? Uh, and I'll put that to the whole panel. Sure, I'll take an initial stab at that. Um, yeah, universal family care is a, is a concept that uh, you know, there are, the study panel developed policy options, but any given state or administration 
uh, or champion that wanted to introduce this to the state or federal level would would tailor it to their to their needs and preferences. So, for example, in in Washington State, they recently in this year adopted a you know long term services and support social insurance program, and in that program, they've decided to let spouses uh, receive uh, benefits from the long term care program. Uh, spouses can be be paid uh, to, as as caregivers for for their spouse, for example. No other family members can, but spouses can. And in order to to acknowledge the sacrifice that family caregivers make, if someone would rather be cared for by their husband or wife than by a professional caregiver, the program tries to make that easier. And that's certainly an option that any state could adopt. Just to follow up from a childcare perspective, uh, I I would echo Ben that this is, since there are states which have varying levels of existing patchwork programs on the uh, childcare side, we do see that some states have made more or less generous options for what we call family friend and neighbor care, so FFN care, um, to be compensated by a program. This is really entirely up to how a state wants to determine who is eligible, and we go into that in great detail in the, in the report. Um, but absolutely states could make those decisions to compensate family or friend or neighbor providers um, rather than exclusively kind of formal center-based care providers for child care. I mean, on, on the paid leave level, it, that is the, by definition, the purpose of it. So there is that. Thank you. I understand, Bill, you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Cecilia. Uh, question is for Ashley. Uh, one of the goals of this report is to provide state governments and community organizations with a toolkit that can help them consider what might make the most sense in their particular state. Can you talk a little bit, Ashley, in Oregon about the politics of these services, particularly long-term services? Were you able to find bipartisan agreement to advance the issue? Thanks, Bill. Um, I think that um, because I work for state government, I can't really speak on behalf of, you know, the state and where we're headed. But I I think what is most appreciated um, by folks in my type of role is just all of the information and how practical it is to talk with um, policymakers about the various options that exist should they choose to move in one of these directions. I mean, we just recently, as Andrea mentioned, we're moving forward with paid family Um, leave, and that's really exciting, and it'll really be up to um, the legislative leadership and the governor to decide um, what, if anything, happens next. But what I can say is that there's been such a massive investment in Oregon, you know, in a bipartisan manner in our long-term services and support system. So, I mean, we have pretty decent Medicaid reimbursement rates. Um, the, you know, all the policymakers have prided themselves in ensuring that Oregonians can remain in home if they want to in our Medicaid program. And then we also have a general fund program that continuously gets funded every biennium um, that's non-Medicaid to give people a little bit of support for in-home services and support. So it's, um, you know, I think it's just, it's such an interesting idea and I think policymakers are I'm eager to hear about it, and they will kind of choose where to go next. Thank you. Um, We don't have any other questions in the Q&A box. Um, I'll give an opportunity if any of the speakers have questions for each other, but let me take this moment to thank you all for participating. Um, So anything from any of the speakers? One thing that I would add, and I, this was touched on by, by Indy and Alexandra, but I think it, it warrants um, underlining again, is that investments in the care infrastructure through a program like this or any of the discrete uh, programs discussed on this webinar would also invest in the workforce. Um, in, 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 this is the second, in long-term care jobs, direct, direct care jobs, they're called, are the second, it's the second, fasting, second fastest growing um, a type of job in the country right now, and it's only you know it's going to continue to grow with the aging of the population, and so and these jobs are not outsourceable. So I think that workforce policy uh, and social uh, social policy dovetail here. 
And if I if if I could add, uh, so just to sort of close here, I think um, really to amplify some of what Ben and Alexander said about thinking holistically and comprehensively, um, we're really in many ways by putting the issues together, uh, hoping to not only build a better set of solutions for families, but uh, make it um, much easier <laughs> to uh, really avoid some of the problems we've seen decades down the line after uh, more piecemeal approaches in other contexts. So, um, for example, when you think about the U.S. health system, you know, we had conversations on the study panel about how mental health, even dental health, uh, which affects overall health, are just still generally kept quite separate from uh, standard health care in many ways, and arguably that has harmed uh, quality of and access to care for those purposes. Um, Similarly, we see that uh, in the case of paid family and medical leave, um, there was a big effort to start with a robust sort of basic structure of unpaid family and medical leave um, that obviously uh, a lot of uh, folks, including um, some of what's documented in this report, suggest we could uh, do much more of and uh, sort of build upon to uh, substantially improve uh, well-being and help families meet their needs. Um, uh, there are people who want to sort of, you know, peel off and just focus on one part of caregiving and that um, certainly warrants every part of caregiving, every need that a family face warrants its own uh, thinking, no doubt. But what can often happen is that we sort of leave out um, and make very difficult uh, uh, decisions, uh, makes families face very difficult to impossible decisions when really the whole point, I think, of something like UFC or generally addressing care needs for families is to take away some of the impossible decisions they face. I think that's such a, a great sentence to end on, taking away some of the impossible decisions that we all must face. Uh, thank you again to Ashley, Indy, Alexandra, Mark, Ben, um, and Bill, do you have any final remarks as we close out? Yes, Cecilia, just to, again, thank all of you who uh, tuned in. Uh, if you thought this was a useful discussion, uh, the webinar has been recorded, and a link uh, with the recording uh, is available following the webinar. And as you note on the slide here, the recording and slides themselves uh, are on the event page uh, available to everybody. So please, if you know others who might benefit from this, direct them to our website at nasi.org. And thanks again to all of you for tuning in.